let's say that you know that this sound is harmful for you. You cannot forget about this, right? Because your brain will focus about this. Oh my God, is it, is it getting worse? So habituation requires actually you to not having negative emotion with your tinnitus. I knew that tinnitus was different for different people, but you said 100 million possibilities, was it? No, no, uh, 100 billion possibilities. 100 billion. Billion, 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 billion. French neurologist Louis Kraskowski is creating an app for people with tinnitus that identifies similarities in users, matching one's conditions with other users and then suggesting potential treatments. The COP app is currently in beta testing, but will be rolling out in the U.S. soon. Join us along with Carlos Ferrer as we discuss our roles in the tinnitus journey, the types, the past to habituation and wellness, learning to live with it, and keeping a positive attitude. Dale, we were discussing about your YouTube channel. And uh, so it's about ambient sound, right? And what we, why we are talking to you is because um, a lot of tinnitus uh, people, people with tinnitus, uh, they use this ambient sound good to go to sleep. Usually they have this huge tinnitus, so it could be high pitched tinnitus or low sound tinnitus, but and they cannot find peace, as they cannot find a sleep. It goes to, uh, to to be asleep, so they would just put their phone next to their bed and hear one of your sound. <laughs> Correct. And for them, you, you know, it's the difference between not sleeping all night and be able to sleep few hours. You know. But uh, the question was, uh, because some video of, like, you have 6 million views, I think, the, the biggest video. So there is a huge uh, demand, right? Uh, how yeah. it happens that you, you find out, because I think you're a sound engineer, right? Right, yeah. I'm a professional audio engineer since the late 1980s, doing live sound and recording. I have a recording studio in Northern California. When YouTube opened up... 12 hour videos, I thought, well, it'd be nice to have a 10 hour pink noise for audio engineers. And so I posted that. And then people started commenting about uses for it that I had not intended on, like getting a good night's sleep or maybe masking the sound of their roommates or their children making noise. And so the sound could help them go to sleep. And then in fact, people said, well, it, it helps me with my ear ringing. So I continued to post more of those, starting with the classic broadcast noise colors, which would be pink, white, blue, violets, brown. And then people said, well, can you do one that's a little higher pitched? So I did very high frequency noise. And I just followed along that path, listening to my viewers and what they wanted and probably self-prescribing noise for myself because I have a little bit of tinnitus from time to time. And early on, we had teenagers that played video games at night. And so it was like, wow, masking is really powerful. And it doesn't have to be very loud, but it can indeed bring calm. And so we listened to a lot of them overnight. And then there's also nature sounds and different sounds, which also help. But the noise has been the, the main focus of the channel. So that's kind of how I fell into it, just listening to the comments and the viewers and then last year, I started doing some tinnitus-specific frequencies to help people, and that's brought even more viewers in, and they're trying different focus noise. So I'll make a noise, and then I'll put a boost at a certain frequency where I think somebody might have ringing, say 13 kilohertz. And then my idea being, after listening to some neuroscientists, that if you can match that frequency, you can retrain the mind away from the ringing sound. So going on that theory, I made some custom noise clips for that purpose. And then some other ones that actually sweep along past a certain set of frequencies in the hopes that maybe it's not a perfect match, but if it sweeps past, at some point it's gonna touch their ringing frequency and give them a moment for the, the mind to focus on this new sound. And that seems to have been beneficial for some listeners. Amazing. And thank you very much. Uh, so I, I have tinnitus too. So hopefully I, I don't need to, to listen to sound every uh, too often. But uh, that's very good to, to have that when we need it. And right. uh, But just a question, because I think um, we have a lot, this, uh, this question a lot. What is exactly um, a white noise? What is exactly a coloring noise? 
Can you explain a bit? Sure. So the broadcast industry came up with these noise terms probably in the mid-early 20th century, and the most common ones used in audio are white and pink noise. And so white noise is an analogy to the light spectrum. So if all the colors were even, you would have a white color of light. So that's just a terminology that we translate to audio. So white noise is even energy of noise across the entire listening spectrum. And uh, so it's just, if you put it up on a real-time graph analyzer of audio, you will see a perfectly flat line of noise. The difference between white noise and pink noise is pink noise is equal energy per octave. So it has a little more low frequency information than being equal across the entire spectrum. However, the way that our ears perceive sounds, we need more low frequency. So pink noise is in fact equal energy as humans perceive, white noise is equal energy in the actual environment. Okay, and uh, on your side, do you, with the, all the feedback you have, well, I think well, now you, you cross the 100,000 subscribers. Subscriber. Uh, 30, I think we're, at, we're almost at 50,000. Hopefully we'll be at 50,000 uh, in a couple 000. months. Uh, how, what is the feedback you get? Uh, Do, do, do people prefer white noise, pink noise? Uh, my channel mostly has been about pink noise. That seems to be what brings people yeah. in. And uh, the white noise hasn't been as popular. I've always gravitated towards pink noise because I like a little more low frequency. But learning from blue noise and violet noise, a lot of people don't want any low frequency and just crave the high frequency. Yeah. So I think as a search term in Google white noise is more popular, but I think that's partially because people are just use that as a generic meaning of static noise versus pink noise. Just to, to, to give you a small, uh, small info about um, uh, what the feedback we had on the noise, because we have an app and I, actually I can maybe sh show you that and people can uh, review the therapies they try. Because usually they have, like we'd call medical wanderings, they try many different therapies. None of them work. But at some point, they find some elements that maybe they can get released. For few people that get completely disappearance of the, the tinnitus, it's still rare, but it happens. And um, on our side, you know, so, uh, and as you said, it's really most common. So the most common is white noise generator. You know, so okay. we have this discussion. However, the things I, I, I discuss with the user is usually they don't like it. <laughs> so, I mean, some uh, get really a lot of help from white noise. But let's be honest. All people say at, at some point it get annoying. At the mm -hmm. opposite, pink noise, it's as you, as you explain well, I think it's better um, in the ear. It's uh, less painful, at some, at less tiring, let's say, after some points. So when you get masking, people will start with white noise, say, oh, my God, it's awful. <laughs> and then, oh, pink noise, it's much better. And then, from what you explained, they go more and more in the granularity. So yes. they will try to pick specific frequency and try by error, error and trial, you know? Right. Yeah, I think that... Uh... People of an older generation remember white noise as the TV, but there's something going on with white noise where it's just so intense that it's setting off some alarms in the mind, which I think is off-putting to the listener and sometimes smoothing it out with bass. My feeling is that pink noise uh, replicates more natural sounds in our environment like waterfalls, rivers, the ocean waves, and probably even being in the womb before we were born. So it's a more familiar, natural feeling sound. Yeah, f f funny story, I, I, I use a lot uh, pink and brown nose. So uh, even for uh, my neuro, uh, neuroscience studies, when I was working for a startup. So, so and usually what you have is uh, as a background for experiments, you put these sounds and hidden, inside you put like a specific frequency ah. 
So you activate specific part of the brain that are tracking this, uh, this sound. And if you put electrodes, you can actually record both signatures of the wow. brown sounds and the specific frequency. So you can, dis you know, you can like uh, click, click on the mouse to, to do that, like uh, simulate the clicking. Because if you put two sounds, like uh, one, for instance, uh, one high pitch, one low pitch, hidden in the white nose, then you will have a specific uh, brain signatures of the eye. I sounds versus low pitch. So, and so those sounds you're interjecting aren't additional noise, but they're actually tones or clicks. Or yeah. yeah. Environmental yeah. sounds. Yeah. Oh, I was just going to say the mind is so incredible at its ability to yeah. sort out sounds within sounds. Like a five year old can hear an oboist in a symphony, even if they've never heard that instrument before. And that seems to be something that even oh. supercomputers are not able to to do yet. <laughs> so that's yeah. fascinating to me. Yeah, absolutely. And and j just the point I wanted to add also is uh, the funny part is you can like hear the sound, but if you don't listen to the sound, some event in your brain are not trigger. So you, you, you can uh, actually your brain is able to inhibit some stimuli and also, it's in a, it's really important on tinnitus because people can train themselves to inhibit their own tinnitus at, after some point, and it's called what we call habituation in general. Yes, it's a, it's like it's coming by naturally on its own, but some for some people, especially for people that have a negative emotion with tinnitus, it doesn't go away. Yeah, this effect doesn't is not trained by the brain because. Let's say that you know that this sound is harmful for you. You cannot forget about this, right? Because your brain will focus about this and look at if, if it's harmful to see if it's higher, lower. Oh my God, is it, is it getting worse? So habituation require actually you to not having negative emotion with your tinnitus. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah, learning to live with it and just kind of... Yeah. I'm seeing some people commenting on that who have been listening for maybe six months or a year saying, you know, I don't use the noise as much because it's just not a big deal to me anymore. And then there's other people that are very agitated about it. And there's even some people that almost have a, uh, a fatalist mindset like this is just so extreme. What are some of the habituation techniques that people might do with well-being to to help reduce the ringing, you know, besides noise masking. Okay, so there are several, but first uh, I, I want to put a cautionary note about this because not all tinnitus can be solved with habituation, okay? So there are, because there are like 10 to 20 type of tinnitus and of course uh, some tinnitus are, are caused, uh, it's a symptom, it's, let's first say it's a symptom, not a disease, okay? But they are caused with either me mechanical problem or uh, with real neurological problem, okay? And both of them can sometimes be actually measured by the doctors if, the, if he's trained. And there are sometimes like surgery operation to help you relieve in that. However, it's only, let's say, 5 to 10% of people with tinnitus. That still means that for 90% of the people, like me, for instance, uh, which called subjective tinnitus. We cannot do anything about this. I mean, to solve it definitely. But uh, so to come back to your question, uh, how uh, we can like accelerate the habituation. Um, so there are some uh, techniques that are now in the literature, scientific literature that are coming out. Uh, one of them is uh, everything which is based on um, uh, meditation. Actually, specifically, mindful-based stress uh, reduction. So why? So on my uh, understanding is because when you are doing meditation, okay, you are training your prefrontal cortex, which is um, one of the most important part of our brain as humans. You know, it, it's an inhibitory cortex. And if it's like a muscle, if it's not trained, you, you won't, be, it won't be able to inhibit other signals of your brain. And tinnitus is one of those signals. So 
uh, if it's not able to inhibit this uh, this signals, you will have constantly in the mind, in the in your uh, uh, in conscious of these changes. But if it's well trained, you can have less and less conscious of these changes. And a mindfulness thirst reduction is also working for other type of similar uh, stimuli, which is negative, like a, a depression. So and uh, you have pain also, chronic pain. So people have like always trash, uh, uh, eight to nine to ten pain all the time, you know, on the scale of two ten. So it's really painful and it's working. So meditation is one of the best uh, good approach. There is also tinnitus retraining therapy, so TRT, which is probably the most common. And actually, this is a sound therapy. So I, I'm not saying that you are doing TRT. The sounds that you are giving are part of t uh, TRT, tinnitus retraining therapy. Okay. The the object behind okay is also used for hyperacusis. So it's uh, the goal is to um, increase the threshold of of pain first of the tinnitus. So the threshold when in which the the tinnitus gets annoying, and to retrain your brain to not accept these uh, signals as. A... I need to explain the theory first. One of the theory be behind is uh, that tinnitus is recording of silence. So there is something wrong in the brain and silence is encoded by a signal in the brain. Okay, to make it very simple, okay? And this encoding, while it's breaking, you have this pitch, okay? So the idea is to make the brain re-encode the different signal, okay? And this is part of TRT. And you can do TRT by, uh, but usually it's like very long TRT. It's like several hours a day, for several weeks. So I, I mentioned two, but uh, we can go even more. So in France, we have sophrology. It's all kind of exercise for managing stress. It's really helping, like similar to meditation. I, I won't go through to that, but in France, we have a lot of that. I think your audiologist also can help you in US. Just to know, in France, we don't have audiologists. We have sophrologues. In uh, US, you have audiologists. And uh, so the practical difference but uh, they, they all have in their toolbox exercise for you to manage tinnitus and it start habituation. And finally, I would say that this is the things that are the most overlooked and underrated. Sleep, having a good sleep, night sleep, it's help you habituation. Good nutrition. If you are feeding uh, with wrong food, your body, probably you cannot have a good and healthy brain to train your body and your uh, uh, brain to accept this tinnitus. And of course, exercise. And especially exercise, which is a moderate intensity. So what we call the aerobic, because uh, aerobic has a, a lot of very interesting, uh, good effect. And especially train you to actually uh, deal with pain because sport is pain, okay? And also you have, like we call the BDNF, so brain derivated neurotropic factor, which is a normal, which is generated when you do aerobic um, exercise. And that actually increase the, the growth of your neurons, not only in the brain. Okay. So all of this can be put into a huge toolbox when you can improve habituation. And I, I hope it wasn't too long, but, <laughs> and there are many more, but... Uh, that is fantastic information. Thanks for sharing that. I think that kind of sheds some light on maybe why more people seem to have tinnitus after the pandemic because maybe they weren't exercising and as active as they were, maybe they weren't eating as well. I've noticed that when I started exercising again, I have less episodes of it flaring up. Uh, yeah, I, I, I just feel, again, put, to, uh, put a cautionary note, um, because all of these are not compatible for every people with tinnitus, okay? I would say that anyway, it's a, it's a recipe for getting better, but for some people it won't work, and especially sport, okay? So maybe you know about pulsatile tinnitus. Pulsatile tinnitus is a kind of objective tinnitus, so if the doctors can detect it, Usually there is a real solution for that. 
it's maybe two to four percent of the population which has pulsatile tinnitus. And if you do sport, you will experience something really annoying because your blood pressure will increase, the tinnitus will be much stronger, and you will hear the heartbeat, like the, the pressure. So it's a really good sign that you have pulsatile tinnitus, and there is no use to do sport in that situation because it will increase your tinnitus, increasing your stress, and you will just get <laughs> uh, just pain, okay? So yeah. maybe do less a stressful sport and try to find someone that is able to detect that. Right. So the pulsatile is actually the perception of blood flow within the ear system. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. Yes. To, to make oh. it simple. Okay? okay. So how it is done, it's, there are several ways, but a possible solution is the, they put a stent. So it's a, a piece in the artery to um, increase the, the section to the, the volume. So then usually the pulsatile, the pulsatile, sorry, uh, decrease a lot. Sometimes it disappears. So tell me a little bit about the, how you guys are collecting the, bringing people into your app and uh, yeah. getting them to share their, their experiences and how you're doing treatment recommendations based on that. We were at the same uh, you know, situations than you, that we observed that people were going creating their own groups on Facebook, talking about tinnitus on social networks, including YouTube. And they didn't find a place when all this knowledge is stored. Because when you go on Facebook, the, on Facebook groups, there are very nice uh, Facebook groups. There is also forum like on tinnitus talk. But this knowledge is not well organized. So for instance, if I share my testimony, the chances are in one or two weeks it's lost in the feed, you know, in, in the timeline. But when I'm sharing my testimony, so I'm sharing what I feel, what I try, what didn't work, what worked for me. This data is a gold mine for research because we can understand better what type of tinnitus you have and what works for you and in what situation. So the idea was to start to collect this data and to make it openly accessible to everybody. So, because there is some initiative of researcher, but of course th they collect the data, but uh, they publish a paper, it takes one, two, three years. So, and then uh, who reads the publication, you know? So it's other researcher, it's not everybody. So the, our idea was really to share this data to everybody and to make it easy to consume. So you can learn from it. So the basic idea is you can document your journey. So document the therapy you have. But before it, we will try to a clinical questionnaire that we build from the, our expertise in tinnitus. So we can find, map out your unique identity of symptoms. Okay? There is about <laughs> 100 billion possibilities that we map out. But we try to find the people that are like you. So we, we compute like a similarity matching. And so you have access to all the other people that have similar tinnitus than you. So this is the first element. And the second element, so of course, because you documented what you try and what worked, what didn't work, you have a way to explore all the therapies that the community uh, discuss. And so you can see uh, yeah, uh, information statistics, satisfaction about this therapy, effectiveness. Actually, we split both because... Let's say that, for instance, uh, you've been to, you did some meditation, but it took you three months and you did that one hour per day. Okay. So it was a lot of work, <laughs> but it, it, it yielded a huge result. So in terms of satisfaction, I mean, if you found out an easier way to do that, you will definitely do that. Yeah. So your satisfaction is, is maybe low, but the, in terms of effectiveness, it's really great, you know? So we split that, and also there is uh, some practitioners that are really helpful, but they don't clearly doesn't solve tinnitus. So some approach that do that. So you need to to meet them, to try them, but to be honest, there is no change in your health, right? Mm -hmm. So we try to to document uh, these two situations. Just to to summarize, a questionnaire 
Then the community, find people like you. So here you have like all the people that are uh, matched by criteria, you know. Then you can see all the therapy. We have one, more than 100 <laughs> wow. that are documented and included the, the one I was discussing, you know, white noise generator, you know, here. And if you click, you see all the discussion about other people and you always see the percentage of matching. So you can always say, okay, should I take this testimony? Is this testimony very important for me or not? That is fascinating. And so the, the app is going to be available here in the United States? Is yeah, already- uh, actually it, it is already, but uh, like uh, we are not discussing about that. It's hidden, it's secret. For now, it's a uh, referral only. So you need to, to have a referral code to get inside the app because obviously it's in beta. There is a lot of work to do. There are bugs to fix, of course, but all the features I was talking are, are working out. You can try it already in US. Probably you will have some sentence in French somewhere. <laughs> uh, and if you try it, by the way, just email us and saying, oh, by the way, I found this bug or I found this translation that was not in English. It helps trem- tremendously uh, all the team <laughs> that is working on this. Fantastic. I knew that tinnitus was different for different people, but you said 100, 100 million possibilities, was it? No, no, uh, 100 billion possibilities. 100 it's theoretical. billion. It's theoretical because we have, we have uh, actually, we are uh, asking questions for 11 different comorbidities that are linked to tinnitus. So wow. it's really granular. And we just decided right now to focus on this 11th dimension. But in the end, we want when we have more data and more people, we want to even go for even higher dimension. Right now, we are working with uh, research data from a doctor, and we analyze. I think it will be forty-eight dimensions that are really defining the subtype of tinnitus that you have. But to go there, we need probably several thousand people who share and documented their whole journey. Mm-hmm. And probably one million user to have very uh, potent predictive factor. Okay, so getting to one million would be a lot of work, but <laughs> let's hope we we get there. There's a lot of work to do, but yeah, it's fantastic yeah. what you guys are putting together, and I'm really excited about it and uh, looking forward to hearing more about it. Finally, the last question for you: um, How on on your sense? Because you have this community of people that really found your YouTube channel, got help, thank to you, and you are really active. You explain your process of finding out specific frequency and going more granular and you know more specific. In your sense, how we could um, recommend a specific sound for specific people? Did you have people in comments talking about this? Oh, I tried this sound and then this sounds. That's yeah. the interesting part. Yeah. So I uh, do say a, a frequency boost, say like 13,000. And then a lot of people have figured out where their um, ringing frequency is. And yeah. they, they, oh, it's it's higher than that. I, mine is around 15,000. So then I'll make a 15,000. I haven't made a video that shows people how to select the frequency, but there are different resources for finding out where your pitch is. And uh, from what I understand, as long as it's within about five or 10% of their pitch. So if, if they have ringing at 11,700 and I make an 11,500, it should potentially have benefit for them. So I'm trying to hit these different ranges and then make some other ones that are more varied in frequency that uh, like there's one that tinnitus scrubber and it kind of makes a kind of a variable sound yeah. changes frequency to hopefully help people with that. But a lot of it is trial and error, reading back on the comments, seeing what people are enjoying and then making another one. So you guys are doing it with an app and probably some artificial intelligence to sort it out. And I'm just reading the comments and using using my mind to say, okay, I think this is the next most beneficial 
content that might help. And then also making some meditation based sounds that are more just okay. for calming and soothing and different things like that. It's an exploratory journey and it's just been amazing to see that it has actually helped many more people than I ever imagined, even at this point. So we're all collectively learning more about what's going on through socials. It's wonderful. Yeah. And I, I mean, for me, it's the biggest learning from here because you have all these startup and big companies that say, yeah, machine learning, machine learning, machine learning. But did you take the time to talk to the people that are suffering from tinnitus? I, you, you know, it's a, it's a rhetorical question. You, you did that. You, you did that. But most of the people, they all say on tinnitus, nobody is listening to, to us. So they go to the doctor and the doctor say, yeah, there is nothing to do. Go home. But right. did you listen to me? That's a very common comment that my, my doctor said, I'm not really experiencing anything or just to not worry about it. Or, and to some people, it's so extreme that, that there's, yeah. they feel really left out in the cold, as we say. And so I think, yeah, just having somebody that's focused on that gives people a bit of hope. And there are some really incredible audiologists on YouTube, like uh, Dr. Cliff and uh, Dr. Ben Thompson, who are listening and creating a comprehensive well-being case-by-case study. And they, they do a lot of content. And then they also have a program where they look at the health side of it, the uh, mental well-being components, and try to wrap that all together. So there are some people in the field that are very compassionate, yet it sounds like a lot of the classical training that people had maybe a decade or two ago has not caught up with modern neuroscience and new discoveries, which are just really unbelievable, right? We didn't even know that neuroregenesis occurred in adults until absolutely 10 yeah. 15 years ago. So this really fascinated me. I, my introduction to that was... Uh, this is your brain on music, Daniel uh, Leviton. And I was just fascinated because all these things I had observed in the audio world were explained in it from a different perspective. And that gave me a lot of insight and, and then a lot more questions. And so it's just fantastic to, to see all this stuff coming about. And so it sounds like your training that a lot of that neuropathy was included in that. Thank yeah, you. yeah. Let, let, let's hope so. And our, our plan for the long term, but uh, we can discuss that when it's ready, is to include actually practitioner and expert inside the app also. So you can discuss with them and also you can have their knowledge readily available for a specific kind of tinnitus you have. So we think about courses so you can record your symptoms before, you can record your symptoms after and during these courses you have explanation about what is about these courses but also exercise between you know a session so let's say you have 10 video 10 session and you do that like every week or every three days and you record and you see if it's working out for you and if it's not working out we can maybe recommend you a different practitioner because let's say that even for the entire landscape of practitioner there will, will be specialists about tinnitus, but there will be specialists about some type of tinnitus. <laughs> wow. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah, I think these are all measures that are going to help us get more people some, some relief. You know, do you think there ever could be a, an absolute cure or is the mind and the neuro pathways just too complex for a, for a pill? Yeah, it's, it, it, I mean, it's complicated. I, I would not bet on this. It's not my... I know I'm not on that side, but I would say that getting a miracle cure that solves everything, it's unlikely. However, we can have a specific miracle cure for some type of tinnitus. So maybe getting one or two percent of the tinnitus people out of the loop because we solve that tinnitus and one or two. So maybe we can decrease uh, the impact of tinnitus overall. But I would say, and this is also, uh, research takes a lot of time and research and effort, okay? So we need also to organize ourselves to have the research uh, which is motivated 
probably by money, like big pharma, they won't put a lot of money with that. So we need to organize ourselves, show the data. Okay, so now you see all these people are motivated. So are you willing to help? And we need to organize ourselves. If we stay alone, nothing would happen, I think, you know? Yeah, that's a great perspective and insight. And I see these, just the fact that we're able to bring these people together through social media and YouTube is creating these focus groups that will give these potential, you know, big pharma the data that they could see, ah, oh, there's a need for this. Because yeah, that's part of the reason people feel out in the cold is because it's been not paid attention to. It's probably one infliction that people have that so many people have it, yet so little has been done to address it specifically. I know yeah. it, I've heard in music about 50% of musicians people that have performed have tinnitus just because of their exposure. And and yet there doesn't seem to be much going on. And I'm, I'm experiencing that in the recording studio where people come in or on stage when I have to set up the speakers for each person. And as people get older, they need completely different tonal balances to be satisfied. So everybody's hearing is so unique that it seems like it would be hard to make a one cure fits all type of thing. But the more we dig into the neuroscience of it and the more data we collect from individuals, we'll be better off towards getting some kind of solution. Yeah. And let's say again, cautionary thought, even if there is a miracle cure, the things is how the medicine is, is how the, you know, the medical science is done. Probably not everybody will have access to it for a simple reason is uh, there is always a trade-off. If it's a brain implant, uh, not a lot of doctors will accept you to put your, your brain implant in your brain, you know, because there is ethical problem, but there is also a clear risk that you die from this uh, operation. So even if there is like a bunch of miracle cure, maybe it won't be accessible to everybody. That's the problem. And we have to think about cost. Uh, like, in France, uh, most of the medical expenses are reimbursed, but tinnitus, you know? <laughs> Why? Because it's not recognized as a disease yet. So right. in the US, I know that uh, you have to pay for almost everything. So anyway, so. Yeah, I mean, we've, we've come a long way in the last few years with medical coverage for most Americans, but certain things like hearing aids in glasses and dental are not covered, so. Oh. But we just had in the United States this year, we're going to, hearing aids are going to become non-prescription, which is probably going to help millions of people and lower the cost of those, which is pretty cool. So, yeah, let's cross fingers. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, anything else? Carlos, what do you have to to say? Comments? Maybe you were quiet, but. <laughs> oh, nothing. What, really what is your happy. take on this discussion? Oh my God, just a, a bunch of knowledge now, a more on their on their understanding of the impact of the tinnitus can have in someone and how it's really connected and close to the noise and the sounds that you can create but by things, just things. And how can that actually solve a really big issue for someone that is suffering from a noise that he's hearing every single time. Um, yeah, it's just fascinating to know that there's people like Dale creating this content, is caring for people. Yeah. Did, 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 because I think Carlos joined us uh, in January, but did you know about Tinnitus before, Carlos? I didn't know. I watched a movie once of, of a racer, these guys that uh, were racing cars. But he was in an accident, okay, when he was a child. And, he, and because of the accident, he had the tinnitus issue. Um, okay. And that was, I think that was my only ap approach that I had. Um, but before that, I yeah. knew very, very little. And because I didn't suffer from it, I didn't yeah. investigate it more. Yeah, because but that's funny because they, they you were saying that 50% of the musician has tinnitus? The statistic I heard is 48%, but not everybody would admit that they have it either, right? Even myself as a sound engineer, I make records. Tinnitus doesn't actually affect 
the my frequency range of hearing, there could be problems with certain sounds right in that band occasionally, but we record and listen back over long periods of time. So, yeah, so a lot of people don't want to admit that they have it or that they're exposing themselves. I was on a tour in the 90s, and my stage would do 11 bands a day. And I had ear mold earplugs. It wasn't cool to have earplugs in, but as soon as I got the band started, one song in, I put the earplugs in because I knew that prolonged exposure was not going to be good. And I try not to ignore those facts. I'm also an enthusiast, you know, motorcycle rider. Uh, I like to use power tools and build stuff and work on my yard. So I'm always wearing ear protection or earplugs to mitigate the amount of decibels that are coming directly into the ear. And that's that's helped um, quite a bit. I'd probably be a lot worse off. I know some audio engineers that are always doing this. What did you say? <laughs> so, you you know, it's just the, the, the sheer amount of exposure. And I know in France, they have, in certain regions of the United States, they limit concert sound level to 95 yes, decibels. Yes. And uh, here you can experience 105. I've been at shows that have gone to 110, 115 decibels. So I always carry earplugs in my wallet. The, the tricky thing when you're an audio engineer is that if you're working the show, you can't leave the building. I mean, sometimes I leave the building now because I use a tablet to mix. You're kind of trapped in that space. Whereas if you're a concert listener, you can, you can leave, go to the lobby for a minute, step yeah. outside. And so a lot of people don't think about that exposure, but many of the other people that have come to the channel did work in motorsports, uh, aviation, construction. I just worked with a, uh, a farrier, right? A horseshoer. And he says, man, I banged on that anvil for 20 years without ear protection. Ding, 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 making horseshoes. Oh, yeah. And so we need to create more of a knowledge about using hearing protection. You know, the government, OSHA has standards, but it just gets pinned up on the wall and then people may or may not follow it. You know, it's followed in extreme factory settings and things like that. But people that are working by themselves, maybe it's not considered. Or the fact that you're driving. I, you know, I talked to an audiologist. I said, do more people have hearing loss in their left ear? And she said, yeah. Yes, yes. She said, yeah. It, it might, well, yeah, you guys drive on the same side as we do. And I said, is that from, from having the window open when you're driving a vehicle? And she said, yes, it, it most likely is. So, right, we expose ourselves to things all the time, and we don't even think about them as problematic environmental sounds. And if we were to go back, my great-grandmother, first time she went to San Francisco, uh, she grew up in a farm. She said, I can't believe how loud the wagon wheels are on the cobblestones. And that was the beginning of the industrial age in the beginning of loud sound exposure that we really didn't have before steam engines, yeah. factories. So if you think about how our listening evolved, we're exposing ourselves over the last 100 years to incredible amounts of SPL, of volume sound and yeah. uh and so we have we have to be careful <laughs> yeah and exactly but i think it's one other mission for regrouping the testimonies and discussing with the community you know spread the word also when when things happen to you uh, i think there is two two big things you can you can do is share your testimony because it's helping you understand also what you are living through what time of tinnitus so when you go to the doctor you're already prepared to put the good words, you know? And the mm -hmm. second is whatever happens, uh, don't keep there, you know? Spread the word. Uh, if you get a relief, explain what helped you because it could help other. And also, uh, if you had like a, an accident, probably you can, could not do a lot about this, but if you have like a sound exposure, maybe you should warn also the people around you to uh, be careful. Not too careful because, of course, the objective is to live, okay? Not be scared about uh, sound because it's, you know, the other bad side. If you are scared of sounds, uh, you can have actually other side effects. 
So we need to have sounds and we need to have strong sounds. But the quantity of energy is what matters and the time it takes. So, so take care of your, your, your ear, but also enjoy the life, right? <laughs> right. No, you're right. Like sounds, and again, this gets back to neuroscience, right? It's when we hear a low frequency sound. I was walking in the park the other day with my wife and we heard this uh, cracking sound. It was a very windy day and it came from above me and it was a big sound. And so immediately I look up because, right, it could be a tree branch. So the sounds and the way they stimulate our mind, the directionality of it, the frequency of it, warned me of the danger. And that's how sound and our perception should work. If I had had headphones in, that could have been more dangerous because I wouldn't have heard that. So there's certain times when the sounds are there to warn us and how they stimulate our mind. I've, I've heard that uh, low frequency energy stimulates the primal cortex in not only people, but in most animals in the uh, entire animal kingdom. And this is because when we hear low frequency rumbling, something could be about to happen, right? An earthquake, a flood, uh, you know, a predator. And so in music, we play with these sensibilities and we create things that, that entertain our mind. But in the real world, these things prevent us, they, they warn us about things that, that could be harmful to us. Tidal wave, whatever, truck coming. So it's fascinating how sounds work with all the sections of the brain and uh, trigger these different emotions and feelings and warnings. It's, it's really something. Absolutely. Uh, the brain is fantastic. <laughs> this is, I, I worked 10 years in neurosciences, uh, so, and lovely. Um, so thank you very much, Dale. Thank you for, for your time. Thank you for uh, taking the time to, to answer this question. I hope you, we answer yours. And um, so uh, what we will do is uh, probably we will share, uh, I, I don't know, did you create an account on Shopee? Uh, I have not yet. Yeah. Okay. So uh, I will share you the uh, referral link so you can you can try on your own. You know, and uh, if you have uh, anybody that uh, need help on this, I think uh, when you are inside the app, you will have your own own referral code so you can invite more people. And uh, yeah, if you want to try the app, uh, let us know. I mean, whatever. If we put a comment or whatever, I, I will try to answer. And um, everybody is welcome uh, to the app. Uh, the, just the only thing is uh, we try to stay positive and hopeful. So, of course, uh, there is a lot of distress for everybody. But um, can we convert the distress into positive energy? I think, I think so. So let's, let's try to do that together and, uh, and improve our condition. Okay? Wonderful. <laughs> Great. Thank you, Louis. And thank you, Carlos. It's wonderful to chat with you guys today. I learned a lot. I'm looking forward to checking out the app and furthering the discussion. Thank, Thank you, Dale. You, Dale. So okay. See you soon. See you, see you later. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Uh, Bye. Bye.